let's go ahead and read the entire psalm, and then I want to, I want to look over this psalm that is just a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, picture of of why God should be praised and why we should be the kind of people that God wants us to be. Uh, starting with verse one, Psalm twenty-four: The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. All right. Now, let's consider what we see here within the text. Okay, I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, all right, that's better. Um, first off, verse, verse 1 uh, and verse 2 is dealing with the idea that God is the creator. Uh, morning, Diana. Good to have you here. It's dealing with the idea that God is creator. Okay? And not only that he is creator, but that he is also, it also shows his ownership. Okay? He has ownership in what, in what he has created. And the people who live in it, which basically are his creation as well. Okay? Note, notice what he says. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and all those who dwell in it. You know, th this is one of those uh, neat little things that show us that even when we do something with our hands, even when we cre uh, make something, uh, we may say, this is, the, this is the work of my hands. Well, when it comes right down to it, God has ownership of everything that's, that's, that's in this world, and God has ownership of ourselves. So anything that we make, anything that we do, belongs to us. In the, uh, belong, I'm sorry, and doesn't belong to us. Belongs to God, even though we claim it is it is ours. I made this. I did this thing. All right. So so uh, the uh, uh, the psalmist is trying to show us that we are. Um, the psalmist is trying to show us that how special God is. How much God deserves to be praised. Okay. Any comments on any of that? Look at verse 2. Verse 2 is a little bit, and I'd love to know if someone has a little bit of a different reading. Let me read again what mine says and tell you what we can know from the what we can know from the from the original language. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Now that word "upon" is basically put in there for our for our uh, what am I trying to say to make the sentence make sense. All right, it could just as easily mean have the word "by" in there. The way, from what I understand, the way the Hebrew is written there, and so the idea that that God founded the earth by or with the seas, with the rivers. All right. Um, when we look at Genesis chapter one, for instance, uh, when we see that God created the heavens and the earth, and it goes on to say the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the deep. Um, then He creates light. But look at the second day, I believe it is. Let me turn back there and read it, so I'm not just I'm not just saying this is what it says. Look at verse six in Genesis chapter one. Then God said. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. 
Okay. Oh, okay. That, that's the creation of the sky, of the separation of the of the sea from the sky, the, the the sky. Now look at verse nine. I'm sorry. Then God said, "Let the waters below the heavens be gathered in one place, and let the dry land appear." And it was so. So the idea we get about the earth when it was first created was that was it was all a mixture of 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 waters, you know. And He separated the the waters above the sky. And we talked about that before. How it seems like there was a water envelope around the around the the earth up until Noah's day, when the windows of the of the sky opened up, windows of the heavens opened up, and the rain came down. Now, that's a long a long account, but but it's the land that I want us to look at. The land was created and came up in the sea, surrounded by the waters. Okay. And so, and so that's the idea being given there in Genesis. What we see here in Psalm 24 again, he founded it by the seas. The, you know, the earth itself, the ground, the land came up. All of that we recognize as the entire planet, the waters and the ground. But we call this land earth. We call this world earth. And, and that idea, and well, and of course this uses the word world, not earth. But the idea that the, the, the world and the waters are all together there. It's more pointing to, pointing to the fact that God is creator than it's pointing to the fact of how, of, 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 of what the world is, is made up of. More along the idea is that this is the reason that it all belongs to God. He created it along with the seas. He established it along with the rivers that are, that are with it. Okay? Um, <clears throat> So, so it, it, again, showing God's, God's power and God's ownership, okay? Now, now he begins to, now that we've seen how wonderful God is, morning, Mike, now that we've seen how great God is and how much God should be, uh, should be uh, glorified and have ownership, now he's going to talk about that ownership of people and what people should be like. Look at verse four, or verse three and four and five. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Now that hill of the Lord is, is, is pointing towards the hill, the mountain that Jerusalem stand, sits on. Remember, Jerusalem is the city of God. Jerusalem has the tabernacle in the, at the time of David, the tabernacle and will in, in his son's day have the temple where God resides. Okay, so who may ascend up to that to that hill, stand in that area where God is, where God resides, you know, in His holy tabernacle? Who may go there? Um, who may stand in His holy place? Stand right there, and, and again, I believe that's not that's not specifically talking about the tabernacle when it says His holy place. I think it's talking about the whole city of Jerusalem. Who may live among God in that area? All right. Um, now, that's not a question that David has uh, one answered for him. He's going to give the answer. He's going to explain since God is creator, since God is the one who has, who has made the earth, owns the earth, owns the people, well, who may be among God in his city? Now, I understand something, and I, I keep saying that phrase, among God. Understand that God is everywhere. We understand that. Uh, God is omnipresent. But God has made Jerusalem his city. And so, and the people who reside in Jerusalem, his people. <clears throat> so he's trying to say, what should those people be like? Uh, good morning, Joshua. Good to have you with us. Um, so, what are these people supposed to be like? Look at verses 5 and 6. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Okay, let, let's talk about those two first. Does that does that idea of having clean hands remind you of a uh, of a New Testament verse? Turn with me, if you will. Hold your hand right here, and turn with me to to First uh, Timothy, First Timothy chapter two. I want you to see a New Testament verse there in First Timothy chapter two. Okay. Look at what it says in verse, uh, in verse eight 
of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Now, there's always been a big question with a lot of people. What does it mean to lift up holy hands? And uh, some people have given the idea that, well, God requires us to, to do this, you know. There's nothing, by the way, nothing wrong with doing this. Everything wrong with thinking it's some kind of it's a, some kind of mere tradition that you must do because the Bible says to lift up holy hands. All right, nothing wrong with that. If that's if that if that means something, if that's if that's something you're wanting to do and praise to God, there's nothing wrong with that. But again, there's everything. I guess I'm way over my head on Zoom. <laughs> I got my hands up like this. Okay, but um, uh, there's nothing wrong with lifting up lifting up your hands. But it's it, there's a reason why Paul is saying it that way in First Timothy. He's not telling them, "I want your hands lifted up in the air." They're already doing it. But what Paul is telling Timothy, and by the way, Timothy is supposed to instruct his his uh, his congregation where he preaches. But what what Paul was telling Timothy is, "I want people's hands, men's hands, to be holy when they pray to me." What does that word "holy" mean? Clean. Clean, okay? Spiritually clean. Very, you know, well, I want to make certain we make it clear what kind of clean we're talking about. Uh, holy gives the idea of, of set apart from doing sin. All right? Set apart from sinfulness. Um, James says something Albert? similar. Yes, ma'am. Uh, your sister says, James 4, 8. I've got that on the screen. Okay, James 4, 8. Um, you say that's on the screen? Yeah. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, oh. you double-minded. Oh, very good. Okay, yeah. Oh, James. James 4. Okay, gotcha. James 4. Um, yeah, yeah. That idea of, you know, cleanse your hands. Again, he's not talking about like we wash our hands before we eat so there's no dirt on them. He's talking about what you're doing with your hands is sinful. You need to get your life right. That's what James is saying. Well, well, and Paul's saying in Timothy, if you're going to be lifting up hands to God, if you're going to be praising God with your hands up in the air, he's not telling them to do it. They're already doing it. That was a common thing. That was a common, uh, common uh, um, cultural thing for the Jews. You see, you see, uh, you see Solomon do it when when he's uh, at, at the dedication of the temple. He looks up into heaven and has his hands up in the air to God. Okay, L looking up, looking up at God. It's, it's a cultural thing. So this is not a command to lift your hands, but instead it's a command that if you're going to be lifting your hands to God, I want your hands, or even if you're not lifting your hands to God, I want your hands to be holy. Don't be using your hands for sinful things and then use your hands in praise to God or in prayer to God. That idea. Now look back again at Psalm, at Psalm 24. And look at what he's saying in that first part. Who's going to be among God? He whose hands are clean. He whose hands are. Now, you're not talking about make sure you wash your hands real good. You know, uh, use that sanitizing stuff like we're using these days to make sure your hands are nice and clean. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, he's talking about don't be using your hands to do evil. You know, do not steal. Do not. I mean, you just name the you just name the sin that you can do with your hands. Do not be doing that. All right. And then he goes and a pure heart. Now again, Jesus spoke about this in in Mark chapter seven. Jesus says in Mark chapter seven. Can you interject something here? Yeah. Um, Bob, for some reason your um, audio is causing some interference, and so I'm having to mute you. If you're wanting to say something, hold up a finger to me or something to let me know. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'm getting feedback sometimes too as well. So. Okay. Okay. Just want to put that out there. All right. Okay. Now, the idea of a pure heart. Jesus talks about that in Mark chapter 7. Again, you know, what's able to defile man? It's not what goes down in the mouth and into the body. It's what comes out of the mouth from the heart, you know, the idea of the heart being being what is our guide or our heart being what it motivates us to do things, our intentions, our thoughts, 
our desires all being coming out of our coming out of our heart, you know, either through our actions with our hands and our feet again, or from our mouths, um, is what Jesus comes right out and says in uh, in uh, Mark chapter seven. Well, that's the same thing here. You need to have clean hands, not being <coughs> using not not using your hands for evil, and a pure heart. A heart. You, there, you're seeing. You can't just be a hypocrite. Well, I don't use my hands for evil, but I don't care about God. And I don't care about being holy. No, you need to have a pure heart, one that is one that is designed or or not designed is devoted to being godly, is desiring to do the right thing, is is leading having its thoughts where it should be, the thoughts of the person where they should be. Okay, so it's not just an outward appearance. Like Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 23, uh, cleaning the outside of the cup, but inside the cup is all filthiness. No, clean the entire cup, speaking about the heart, uh, the inside of the cup being the inside of the person. Okay. Um, now, Albert, yes, Bob. It reminds me of a verse in uh, Psalms 51, verse 10. Okay. Create a clean heart. Mm. in me, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. This has to do with the inner man, mm -hmm. not not necessarily just raising your hands, but the heart has to be clean. It has to be pure and, and, and fit to stand before God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, in, in our reality, Christianity is an inward, an inward uh, religion. And it is a religion, by the way. James chapter 1 makes it clear, pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit the widows and, and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That idea of, of living God's word, not just, not just giving lip service to it and, and not just doing it with, a, with an evil heart, with a, with a hypocritical heart but living God's word. So yeah, so we want a, a new heart created in us, one that is devoted to God, okay? Um, so that's that idea. If you want to be on God's and give, remember what the, what the question is. You want to be among God? You want to be with God on his holy hill? Then you clean your hands. You have a pure heart. You do not lift up your soul to falsehood. This is one of the biggest things that we... You know, we, we like to we like to rate our sins and say, yeah, well, lying is not as bad as murder. OK, please understand something. God doesn't rate sins that way. You know, you look at the abominations in in Proverbs chapter six, verses 16 through 19, the seven things God hates. And, and you see there that that God, uh, that two of those things is lying, lying with the mouth, being a false witness and uh, one who speaks lies. All right, so two of those things have to do with using falsehood with your mouth. God hates lying. So much so that the, the Hebrew writer makes it clear it's impossible for God to lie. But we, we need to become like God. God doesn't lie. He doesn't want falsehood around him. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 makes it clear that all liars have their place in the lake of fire. Lying is not a middle white lie. Lying is a huge, big sin. No more than any other sin, but certainly no less than any other sin. Okay, and God doesn't want it around him. You want to be on my holy hill? Again, remember, when David wrote this, we're going to say something about that here in a few moments, but when David wrote this, his God resided in Jerusalem among his people. All right, the last thing is, and has not sworn deceitfully. Once again, we talked about that giving false witness or swearing swearing before others and, and not meaning it, not doing it, all right? And verse 5 says, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. The one who has that type of, of uh, who, who has that type of attitude, who is able to come among God. Basically, in context, the great blessing from the Lord, number one, includes being able to be among, with God. That is... One, that's obviously one blessing that's being being implied here. But the blessing is having God as your God, having God take care of the things he promises he's going to take care of for you. Okay, God blesses those who are who stay with him more than those who are against him. Again, God sends, 
Jesus says God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. So God blesses everyone. But there's a special blessing of being God's people. And then everything that's included in that. Um, uh, and righteousness. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Now that one most certainly we can see a New, New Testament application. You know, we, none of the good that we can do can make up for the sin that we've committed. But God extends righteousness to us when we are living the way God would have us to live, when we are turning our backs on sin, repenting, turning our backs on sin, when we are striving to do God's will. He extends his righteousness, the righteousness of his Son upon us. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, we find out that all those who have been baptized have been clothed with Christ. It's as if God is looking at Christ when we have put him on in baptism. Morning, Pam. So, so the idea being given there is that, is that God, you know, we, our righteousness, our sinfulness covers over any righteousness we might do. But Christ's righteousness covers over that around us. God extends his righteousness to us. Go ahead. Ten minutes. Okay, oh, ten minutes. Thank you. Well, what, I tell you what, it may not seem like we're doing good, but you're going to see the latter part of the, the, latter part of the, of the psalm is all talking about the same thing. So, and I, and that, that's going to allow me to make my point for us today. So, 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 uh, okay, I think I've said everything I wanted to say about verse 5. Verse 6, this is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Even Jacob, my translation says. Remember, Jacob is the, is the other name, the original name of Israel. When he's saying those who seek your face, Jacob, he's talking about the Israelites seeking his face. We talked about yesterday how the spiritual how the spiritual Israelites, the spiritual Jacob today, is are, are the Christians. We are spiritual Jacob. Well, this is the generation who seek his face. Who are? The ones who have clean hands. The ones who have a pure heart. The ones who are not lifted up to our souls to falsehood. The one who have not sworn deceitfully. Those are the ones who God is going to give blessing. Those are the ones who God is going to extend his righteousness around. These are the ones who are going to be able to be in the presence of God. All those things wrapped up together. This is the generation. Those who seek him. Who seek his face. Well, you're going to see his face. You're going to be among him. Okay? Uh, there. So, now... Verses seven through ten. Let me just let me just take care of those real big in a big in a little snippet. All right, that's saying allow God to be in you, allow God to be there, and lift up your head. Think about it. Okay, one second, and okay. lift up your head. The idea of be be proud, not in a bad way. Be feel the glory of having God among you. Let me say it that way. Sorry, go ahead. Albert, I don't I don't think this righteousness is something miraculous, but it, it comes about because God has already given us all things that we need. And if we learn those things and then practice and grow in that, then that righteousness will automatically be ours because we're trying to do that which is right. Well, I, I agree. I agree it's not there's nothing miraculous about it. It's providence from God. But you're right, right that you're right that we are supposed to be living that way. But again, in righteousness from God of His salvation, because we're living that way, God extends His the righteousness of His Son around us. Remember, uh, remember what Jesus says in in uh, in Matthew chapter six in the Sermon on the Mount, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. But seek after, uh, but seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And these things will be added unto you. Okay? At the very beginning of chapter 6, uh, morning Janet, morning Carol, at the very beginning of, of Matthew chapter 6, it says, Do not do your righteousness to be seen of men, but seek after his righteousness. You're absolutely right, Bob. We are supposed to, we are supposed to be doing good God, the good works God has given us to do. But none of those good works can take care of our sin. 
doing those good works, God promises he will extend his righteousness around us. It's a very fine line, a very fine point that we're seeing here. But I don't deny at all our requirement to do God's will. We just need to recognize whose righteousness it is that saves us. It is what Jesus Christ did on the cross that saves us. It is that he is the one who, who, who lived the perfect life that saves us. That's what Peter was indicating in, in uh, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in knowledge. We, we obtain the grace when we grow and practice the, that which we learn. Amen. Excellent. Yeah, God extends his favor upon us when we are doing his will. Exactly. Exactly. Now, real quick, I, I think I've only got a couple minutes left. And I want to make one point after I, after I show this. Just look at 7 through 10. As I said, re allow the glory to be among you. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O angels, that the king of glory may come in. You know, do live the way you should, that God will be among you, that God will want to be among you. Who is the king of glory? God is, the Lord, the Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Then he says again, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? Again, the Lord of hosts, the king of glory. So you need to live this way. You need to be this kind of people so that you, so that God could be among you. Now, let me make quick application on that. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We understand that God's, God's church is his temple today, is where God resides. That is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to go to 6, but let me just mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he makes that clear about the church as a whole is the temple of God. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he's talking to individuals and telling them that they are the temple of God. Look at what he says um, um, in verse... Uh, uh, well, where to start? Um, I'll go all the way back up to verse 14. Boy, i got to do 14 through 20 real quick. Look at this. All right. Now God has not... Uh, now God has not only raised raised the Lord, but he will also raise up us through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself with a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself with the Lord is, a, is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. What we use our bodies for. God resides in the Christian. He is among us. Do not use your bodies to do sin, all right? Just like what we see in Psalm 24. God is among you, or you want him among you. Have holy hands, clean hands, have a pure heart, because you, if you want to reside among God, well, for the individual Christian, if you want God in you, if you want to be with God, you know, live a holy life. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm, I'm stretching it here, we're going to run out of time. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, all around verse 30 of Ephesians 4, Paul tells them about sins they're not supposed to be committing, and Paul tells them about the clean way they're supposed to be living. Just look at Hebrews chapter 4, 17 to the end of the chapter. But in, in the middle of that, all of that, he says this in verse 30. <clears throat> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. God lives in you. He is your seal. Do not be committing these sins so that God does not want to live among you anymore. An Old Testament, Psalm 24, talking about the physical Jerusalem. The New Testament, temple of God, is our bodies. How we live is going to determine, determine whether God wants to live in us or not. Made it. <laughs> Zoom is still open. Cool. All right. 
Any comments on any of that? Linda says Acts 5.32. Acts, okay, what's that? Acts 5.32? Uh-huh. Let me look it up real quick. Okay. Um, if we cut out, make certain you look at Acts 5.32. Okay. 5.32 says, yeah. and we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. There you go. Very good. The Holy Spirit whom God yeah. has given to those who obey Him. That's great. One and when minute. you don't obey Him, what's that? One, One minute. minute. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and have our prayer. Uh, we, we made it through. Uh, that's good. And someone, if you don't tell me what psalm you want to go to next, I'll be doing one on my own. So I'll be looking. Okay, be looking and text me or whatever. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time we've had to study your word. We love the fact, Father, that we can be among you and you among us. Help us, Father, to live in such a holy way that you will want to be with us. It's in your Son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.